One of the standout books for last year is Professor Olufemi Vaughan's Religion and the Making of Nigeria, which made our top 20 Nigerian books for 2017 list. This book boldly addresses the critical issue of the role of religion in the creation of Nigeria from both scholarly and lay perspectives. Using a wealth of archival sources, the author traces Nigeria's social, religious, and political history from the early 19th century to the present. The author, Professor Vaughan, is a Nigerian academic whose research and teaching focuses on African political and social history, African politics, diaspora studies, African migrations and globalization, religion, and African states. We showed you the review session we had with him and promised to bring you a second part sometime. Well, in fulfilling that promise, here it is. It's part of the problem we're having in Nigeria, that reluctance to embrace these realities. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I think in a way, you see, in, in looking at the evidence, extensive archival materials, government documents, religious documents and so on. One of the things I saw is that the clamor for expanded Sharia tend to happen at specific moments in history. If you see what I mean. They're not, yeah. really, they're not really something requested all the time. All the time. They tend to be, the, the pressure for expanded Sharia tend to happen in times of political uncertainties and crisis and instability. And that's why you argue it's a Absolutely. political issue. In a way, at a time when the nation state is in crisis, religion now plays a key role in defining the essence of the community. It defines collective social action. So context matters a great deal. If we see this solely as religious, then we have to arrive at one conclusion and one conclusion alone. Why is it that Muslims in northern Nigeria and central Nigeria are not asking for Sharia all the time? They tend to clamor for Sharia and insist on Sharia in times when the prevailing political configuration in the country has failed the masses of ordinary people and the aspirations in northern Nigeria. They, so, they being the political leaders. They being, they're here being... The, the, being the, the masses of Muslims in northern Nigeria. But masses so, of Muslims in northern Niger Nigeria do not request for Sharia, do they? Well, I mean, the, in, the, the, in reality, the, the, in reality, the people who tend to request Sharia tend to be most conservative Muslim clerics, right? And conservative Hausa Fulani and Kanuri Muslim power brokers, mm. not just the political class. But I think it's also very important that it's not all of them, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But it's really important to also recognize that even when you articulate an idea, it must, for it to succeed, it must resonate in society. So we don't want, want to just see this in a simple, straightforward way, as a bunch of political and religious leaders manipulating the vast majority of local people. What is critical here is, in specific moment in post-colonial Nigerian history, the pressure for Sharia resonates with the masses of Muslims in northern and central Nigeria. In my view, as a defense mechanism and a way of trying to articulate a sense of renewal, right? Speaking to the idea of a reformist governance that can meet the needs, the aspirations, the concerns, of Muslims. My own argument is, if the prevailing political system functions well and serves the vast majority of Nigeria in terms of providing the essential goods and services they need, education, healthcare, job opportunities, entrepreneurship, the question of militant and Islamist uh, request for expanded Sharia will, will be essentially minor. They just simply won't resonate with the majority of Nigerians. There are so many predominantly Muslim countries in Africa south of the Sahara, and by the way, in the Maghreb, that are not governed by Sharia. So the argument that you always have to have Muslims being governed by expanded Sharia, in my view, is a very short-sighted argument. 
What that kind of argument does essentially is to reify religion as the primary variable. I am arguing in this book that religion here is a secondary variable, not the primary variable. Religion is essentially an instrument, a tool, an idea, an ideology that has been constantly deployed for political usage, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be extremely effective in societies where, where religious structures and doctrines and practices are essential to the definition of the culture and the realities of the people. This will be the distinction between northern Nigeria and the southwest of the country. Islam is not integral to Yoruba culture, just in ways in which Christianity is not. Christianity and Islam are two dominant world religions in southwestern Nigeria, but Yoruba culture and tradition and ethnicity and hometown loyalties and ancestrality prevails over religion, over these two world religions. This isn't to say that Yoruba Christians and Muslims are not pious Muslims and Christians. They are. They take their religion very, very seriously. But it is virtually impossible to define Yoruba identity as fundamentally religious because the two world religions in Yoruba societies are what? Relatively new. Whereas in the case of northern Nigeria, Islam goes back many, many centuries. You cannot really talk about being a northerner in, in Nigeria. You can't talk about being Hausa, being Kanuri, being Fulani, being Nupe, without also talking essentially about being Muslim, if you see what I mean. Or, you, or not being. Or not being Muslim, mm. if you see, yeah. So, mm. so in a way, uh, the subject of ethnic attributes and identity are by their very nature religious. So I use the term in the book, Eth what is ethno-religious is also, also ethno-regional in northern and central Nigeria. Whereas in, in southern Nigeria, particularly in the southwest, it is essentially ethno-linguistic modes of collective social action. The essence of collective social and political action, I should emphasize, in northern Nigeria as a strategy of mobilizing large populations of people is in itself premised on the logic of religion. And that is really the flashpoints. And that is what, what I think our leaders and educators and policy people need to be mindful of. If you see the point mm, I'm making, yeah. that, that what... So the, the basis of comparison for me is not just simply to compare Nigeria to other Muslim, predominantly Muslim countries. That would be a good comparison. But the basis of comparison is actually within Nigeria across the niger benue confluence. There are fundamental distinctions there, as we've seen played out in Nigerian politics over, over since, since decolonization in the early 1950s. Professor Vaughan, nice to have you on Channels Book Club. Unfortunately, we don't have so much time to explore this. So many things to look at in your book. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much. I hope you have enjoyed your time with us today. As always, we look forward to getting your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. I am Ola Kunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.